Today we're going to be looking at uh, the topic of exploring wearable resistance for football and we have a, a we're very lucky and privileged to have obviously Matt Brown who's part of the Paris Saint Germain uh, uh, sports science team. Matt has been uh, engaged with us for a few years now but before I go into detail and explain that I get Matt maybe just introduce yourself to everybody and your role there with the performance department. Yeah, so I'm the uh, Academy Sports Scientist. Um, I'll be going into my fifth season um, when we restart next month. Um, I'm responsible for the uh, training load planning and periodization, and then also the data collection, management, and vis uh, visualization. Um, and I also support the um, SNC. Uh, training for the teams, and I'm, a spon I'm the SNC coach for the reserve team here. Um, and then alongside this, um, I'm studying for a doctorate uh, with an aim to assess the benefits of using the Leela exoskeleton for football training. So this is obviously where I, it comes in with working with you guys and working with uh, AUT in New Zealand as well. That's fantastic. Um... Well, you've got the right partners there with JC. If you're trying to get a PhD done, that's the guy to work with. Absolutely. They are, <laughs> they are an absolute research mill. And, you know, yeah. that's one of the reasons we, Leela, we, uh, that was the very first partnership from the company. And for those who just signed in, a uh, quick introduction to myself as well. I'm, my name's Joe Dalsetti. I'm the CEO of Leela Movement Technology. And I'm the guy that created the Exogen Wearable Resistance System. But I've, I've got 35 years of skin in the game in high performance sport. The, I've been in the Asia region for the last 20 years. I was out, uh, started in Malaysia with National Sports Institute out here for Sydney Olympics, Athens Olympics, Beijing Olympics. And after Beijing, I left and I started, I've been working on Leela for 10 years. And before that, I was back in Canada with Team Canada, um, most sports, but also I was in the NBA and the NHL. So I've been working at a fairly elite level since I about 19, 20 years old and started in SNC and then high performance periodization training conditioning. And now my time is pretty much focused on being the leader in the ap application of exogen uh, and wearable resistance. You know, I've been, I've been training with wearable resistance for over 17 years since my, the first prototypes that we were using at the Athens Olympics in 2004. And now I do a lot of consulting one-on-one -on -one with the pro teams and programs that we work with uh, around the world. And, and it's a significant group. And, and of course, none, none bigger or, or greater is certainly in the world of football than something like Paris Saint-Germain. Um, and Matt, um, we, our connection goes back. My connection with PSG started with Martin Boucher. And I was uh, invited by Martin to come in and introduce Exogen right there in Paris. I know I think it was about three years, two and a half, three years ago now. And we were there on the ground with you guys. We brought the kid in. And since then, uh, Paris Saint-Germain has pur purchased a significant amount of Exogen across the academies and the, and the senior teams. And, there's a, and, and the reason we started with Paris Saint-Germain for everybody to know is I was always very impressed with the fact that they were really trying to drive the science, you know, and as I got, I found out when I got there and as your role talks to it, sports science is really at the front of what you're doing. And that was something that resonated with us because we weren't just trying to throw the product on people and sell the picture, you know, like a Ronaldo uh, 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 endorsement. We were, we were, to be honest, we were really, and we are still learning about wearable resistance. And it's and as you'll find out today, coaches and people listening, it's not just another dumbbell or weight, weighted vest. And Matt, maybe what you can do is share a little bit more about how just what what Paris Paris Saint Germain is doing. Like you said, at the academy levels, from the sports science side, the areas of interest where they're engaging, and of course the performance department and and the whole role that's really been developing there. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um... Paris Saint-Germain is a club with the goal of becoming the best team in Europe, if not the best team in the world. Uh, so to fulfill those ambitions, uh, we understand that we must utilise the best technology, the best training techniques uh, to maximise the performance and potential of both the first team players and the academy players. Um, the club also understands that um, a healthy performance department where new studies are undertaken uh, to assess uh, 
this new technology and training equipment is vital for further development. Uh, so this is why uh, we have such an interest in Leela uh, and how it can provide that extra 1% that we all know makes a difference between being a good team and being the best team. And also the difference between having good players and having physically the best players possible. Uh, and so this is where kind of my life I was hanging command started. Uh, I was brought to the club to develop the sports uh, science department within the academy um, and also to perform uh, studies to assess the performance benefits of Leela as part of my doctorate. Um, so my journey over the last four years has led to here where alongside Leela and um, the Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. uh, we currently have um, three studies underway assessing various aspects of um, how Leela can be used um, to benefit football players, as well as lots of experience of using Leela for team training, um, return to play training, and also on an individual level. As, as you said before, you said that you've been using Le um, kind of wearable resistance training for the last 17 years. And it's the same here where we believe that if we can train with this and we know how to train this with, uh, with this technology, then we can pass this on to the players and we can pass um, kind of our experiences of using this training um, on and get better results from this. You know, it's fascinating because a lot of, and, and you've got, I, like, again, unfortunately, we don't know who everybody is, are we, are their coaches? I imagine there'll be a mix of trainers, coaches, assistant coaches, s &Cs, different people from the clubs, but a lot of sports teams look to buy technology and this and use it. You guys have invested in this. I mean, I know we've got almost 70 or hundred suits there that you bought and they've got dedicated sports science people to study it, which, which really, in my mind, I mean, not a lot of clubs are doing that. They're not also dedicated to creating the information on new tech. They're just adopting new tech and sticking it in, right? Like new performance and now like when Catapult came out or other PA systems, they bought it and used it. But PSG has bought it and is learning about it so they can implement it at the highest level. And that's, that's, a, really, that's a really unique and a leading edge thinking on the part of management there. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like you said, because that means PSG is patient. They want the best and they're really putting in the money, the time and the effort to develop, you know, the academy players because that's their bread and butter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and when I first arrived, obviously Martin Buchheit was the head of performance here. Um, and he's world renowned for um, developing new training techniques, using new technology. Um, and being really on the forefront of everything so that if if there is a new system to use new technology he what he wanted Paris Saint-Germain to be the first one to assess the benefits of this and then um, if we see that there is clearly something good to come with this then we can implement this into the training programs um, in, in an aim to get these players to be the best they can possibly be um, and as you say, it goes further than only taking new tech and using it straight away and hoping mm -hmm. for the best. We, we are here to quantify this new tech and really assess its benefits um, and to see where we can best use um, this in terms of the football training on the field or whether it's for um, injury prevention, return to play stuff. Um, and this is uh, why I've the, the research I've been doing over the last three years has been of benefit to both um, the club, but also the, the wider football community, hopefully. Yeah, that's incredible because eventually that information will benefit PSG, but it will, it will benefit the game of football, you know, and that's creating a better product for everybody. Yeah, that's what we hope. You know, we um, football, as, as any sport is, is a, a forever developing uh, thing there's always new things that are going to improve the game there's always um, things that will need to be adapted because the way the game is played is different like even looking now over the last 20 years you look at the you compare the players and the amount of high distance high speed running the doing the amount of sprints the physical demands of the game are just completely different in mm. within two decades and so 
to ensure that these players are um, able to cope with these demands, we need to adapt the training techniques. We need to adapt the way that they play football to ensure that they can still have that prolonged career over 15, 20 years. And so things like Leela um, are what's going to help football players prolong those careers and keep them at the top of their game for as long as possible. Yeah, it's, like I said, that's, and, and we, you know, we filled that into the title, leading in, in the way, area of tech, but you really are. Because like you said, bearing, paying money to bear fruit for the future. A lot of professional programs around the world don't think that way. They're like, I'm spending money to win now, you know, and never mind what's going to happen next year or two years. And, and, and to be honest, it's one of the very first clubs I think that we've worked with. And we're working with everyone from Golden State Warriors, Minnesota Vikings, New Zealand All Blacks that are, that are putting that level of commitment in. And in some of those programs, it's happening elsewhere, like in the high school or the college system anyway, right? PSG has like uh, top to uh, bottom to top, right from grassroots up. But it for sure, it, it speaks loads to PSG being, yeah, being a leader in the area of tech. And, and, I, and what's really exciting, that's why one of the reasons we chose PSG at the start when I was talking to Martin and, and I was, he was telling me, he said, no, we don't want just want to bring this in. We can, the, the price isn't a problem. We can buy kit, but we want to learn about it. And so I immediately made that connection together with Dr. John Cronin, who runs all research for Leela. And that was a real bonus for us. Having someone like AUT Sprint and John Cronin behind the product so much and not on a paid contract, but as the adopted leader to study it, uh, you know, it's, it's really helped those conversations because high tech clubs now, they don't even want to talk to us if we don't have the research and the science. You know, you can't call them up on those phone calls and say, Oh, I got something that's going to help. They'll, you know, they'll just say, talk to my sports science guys. If, if you can't convince them, I don't have time for you, you know? Mm. And, and on that, are you guys seeing a lot of new tech coming? I mean, you must be inundated in a place like PSG. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, even on things like LinkedIn, you get daily messages, weekly messages of people offering new nutritional supplements, new weightlifting equipment, new on-field equipment that they want to sell to you. Um, you know, partly because it's such a big club, but partly because they want to get their, their equipment into football. So it's very, I think it can be very difficult to kind of sift through everything and find the real quality products. And that's what's been really nice about working with Leela is that we've had the opportunity to get the kit in, perform this research and really confirm kind of our um, kind of our, our thoughts in the first place that this kit can be really beneficial for football. So it, it's, it's been really nice that we've had that that time and that the clubs backed us to do that as well so that we can well, effectively in, improve the performance of the players. Yeah, no, before we, we're going to jump in now and get into some of the meat of what you're doing with wearable resistance, but just a little thought because there's a lot of, I don't know the background of the coaches sitting and listening, but I imagine because you guys have done so much in this space, you've got a pretty good filter to know what science is good and what you look for and how you vet through that. And some of these coaches or trainers that might be listening, they might not have the same amount of manpower and time there, but you know, from what I understand, there's some pretty high level programs here in, in the webinar. Um, any advice, any thought on how you filter through that? You know, uh, just at the club level, what do they have to watch for new areas that are looking exciting? I mean, of course, other than wearable resistance, but just how you guys handle that filter, because I imagine some of these coaches and, and trainers and people we were listening today have that same issue, but maybe not as much support around them to make decisions. Hmm. I think one of the important things that we do is that in terms of deciding on the research that needs doing the products that we need, the equipment that we need to use, it starts on the field. So all of the questions and all of the um, these thoughts come from observing the training, talking to the players, talking to the staff and saying, OK, what do we need to do to improve the level of football here, to improve the level of physicality of the players? And from there, we can then go away, look at the, the research, whether it would be training techniques, whether it would be new products, such as Leela, and say, OK, um, we need to 
then decide how we can get from where we are now to where we want to be and what we need to do this. Mm. So it's, it's yeah, always it's field led. Yeah, it's always a field led approach to decide exactly on what tech we need to get to where we want to be. Yeah, I think that's important because sometimes when you get a new tech or a nutrition supplement or a new training tool, you just you look at the tool in front of you and you start thinking about the tool rather than you say, okay, well, what's the problem we have? What tools go into that? Does that tool look like it fits into that problem? Because if it doesn't, it's off the table. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. And we get in SNCs, especially, I mean, I spend years as an SNC, you get stuck thinking about the tool because you're sometimes even divided from the player because you're in the gym or you're away from the game, you know, and that's happening over there and you're happening over here. So yeah, it's interesting. I just thought because everybody's in a tech overload right now. Yeah, I think one of the important things as well is to think on an individual level as well. So if you're uh, working with players and you're doing things because other people have done them before, that's probably not necessarily the right, right, the right way of thinking. You know, don't, don't be stuck in the same mindset and the same processes over and over again when potentially the things that you're doing are not helping anybody. So always be looking for how things can be improved and by doing that, it is, it's a really, really simple way to kind of filter out stuff that you really don't need to be doing and bring in new things such as new techs mm. that will improve performance. Mm. Yeah, well, and, 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 and football, like every sport, you know, there's a, a lot has been grandfathered into the game, right? Yeah. And I think, and you know, that's a challenge, especially if you're an SNC and you're working under a coach who might not be as tech savvy, but you are. I think it's a delicate game, but hopefully today we're going to give them some firepower to go in and talk with their team and share some more information on, on, on what's happening in the area of football, certainly with wearable resistance. Now, what I suggest we do now, Matt, just for those who haven't seen it, we have a short two minute clip, which is a kind of a product intro video. It just walks through the, the product really well. And so people get an idea of what we're talking about once they, uh, we get into the meat here. So let me, let me pull this up. Let me share a screen here first. Um, and just for you guys and, and gals that are listening, we'll, we'll, any questions you have, you can put them into the chat. Uh, one of our staff here, Eugene, is following along on the chat. And if it's a relevant question that needs to be answered during that, that moment or that time, he'll let us know. But if not, we'll have a, a good Q&A at the end. And, um, but don't, don't be shy to say, jump in on something. If, if something happened and you didn't understand it, we can, we can run it back. Fair enough. Okay, let's. Um... And I'm just going to move this over. Should run, let's see. If not, I'll have to open it up straight. Okay. Now, I don't know why we're having a, is anybody hearing this? Mm, no, no. Okay, hold on a sec. Let me try something different. I think it's because I'm sharing screen and it's not allowing me to switch screen in, on the PowerPoint. Um, I'll just switch directly to, to uh, the internet. One sec, guys. Sorry about that. Give me two seconds here.
Okay, let's. Uh... I'm going to share screen now. Music licensing to be imagined. Music licensing to be imagined. Music licensing to be imagined. That's the little clip. So let me go back here to the presentation. So that's exogen, wearable resistance. In a nutshell, if you didn't see, they're very light, micro thin, very flexible. I mean, ridiculously flexible. Adam will talk a little bit about that. I'm oh, sorry, Matt will talk about that. Comfortable. And those range from 50 grams up to 300 grams. So you can get up to 10% to 15% of body weight, basically on any part of the product. It has a bunch of features and you guys don't worry if you don't see this now, we'll send you the video clip and, and certainly Adam can help us share some of the information. But we spent 17 years developing it for a reason. It's, it's the very best of everything went into it. Now, this is a slide. Can you see this slide there, Matt? Yeah, that was good. Um, this is an important slide for you coaches. So people ask, well, wearable resistance, you know, where, what is it? Where does it fit in? Wearable resistance is just with resistance training. Remember that there's no magnets here. There's no, you know, nutritional supplements that don't have backing. It's just weight training. And we know weight training works. Now, something to think about the majority of weight training in the last 20, 30 years has really been focused on this area. And this is your force velocity curve. So force means muscle force. As muscle force goes high, velocity, we'd like it to go fast, but it doesn't. And basically what happens in sport is most training emphasis is here. Heavy force, high force, but low speed. And that's your heavy traditional resistance training. Free weights, barbells, squats, power cleans, machine. Now, in the last 20 years, especially, we've, we've, we've started to come down the curve. And the problem, oh wait, the problem with this here is most training happens here, but most sport happens here. And so there's a disconnect between where a lot of people do their strength training or their additional fitness training and what the demands of the sport are. But certainly we're getting better. You know, in the last 20 years, a lot of new tools have come out. 
that are a modified form of traditional resistance training, things like bands, weighted implements, tubing, weighted vests, they're getting a little bit faster to use. They become a little more sport and movement specific. They're still kind of force focusing on maximum or high level force, but speed is still not what you would call pure competition speed. And movement is still restricted because as you can see here, they're external. Tubing is external. Weighted vests, because of its bulky nature, becomes external. Implements and bands and cables are all external, which means the person has to adapt to the equipment, not the other way around. And where we are now is we're saying, okay, well, sport is here. It's not very high force, but it is usually very high velocity. And that's where wearable resistance really sets itself apart from the bar. So we still need all these tools, but what's important for people to understand is what you do here can really be limited at the end result here. And as Martin, uh, sorry, uh, Matthew, we've spoken about this with yourself and Martin a lot, you know, what, where does a squat really fit in on a senior team at the pro level? You know, what is that really doing for them at that stage of the game? And what, and sort of like you said, what do they need on the field? Because that's the question we have to be answering. And max strength is not many people's problem. So I'm going to leave this slide. We're going to jump in now. Matt, um, I'll let you take over here and you just guide me through this, the, the, the slides as per your presentation. Okay, perfect. Um, what I'll do just before I go into the, the kind of the, the research that I've been doing is I'll briefly talk to you about kind of my first impressions of um, Leela. Um, what we first thought about it, how, how we first used it before we started the studies. Um, so yeah, as um, Joe said there, um, wearable resistance is not a new training concept. Um, we've had things like weighted vests, ankle weights, and even running with a bag of rocks being used for decades to increase training intensity. However, when I first uh, saw and used Leela, I realized it was a completely new adaptation to this training concept. So first impressions from looking at the product itself is it's really slick, it fits really well, and it moves with the body uh, thanks to those compression garments and thanks to the way that those, uh, those weights bend and move with uh, the body's movements. Um, the weight of the load and the load orientation, so where you place that load is completely customizable. Uh, the surfaces of the compression garments can hold load. So all of the surfaces that you see can hold those loads. So it's completely your decision of how you, this load can be used. So upon using Leela as well, I soon realized that it does not take a heavy load to increase the intensity of a training session. So this product, as Joe says, looks to increase the velocity at, uh, which exercises are performed with small loads in an aim to increase overall force outputs. So therefore using a relatively small load of maybe only one to 2% of body mass, but carrying this out during sprints or high speed running or um, sport specific movements, um, it really does increase the difficulty of the training um, and it is going to uh, help to develop the athlete. So while the product made a good in, uh, first impre impression personally, it was also important for myself and the performance team here um, to earn the buy-in from both the, the technical staff and the players uh, for Leela. Um, and the first thing that helped with this was the ease of use and the speed that Leela can be put on the players. So as, as you'll all know, working in football clubs, um, the training ground before training can be a really, really busy place. The players have to go to the physio to get straps or to get massages. They may have um, injury prevention protocols that they'll carry out before training. They may also have team meetings or video and an, um, analyst meetings. Uh, and so as a performance team, we only really have kind of five to 10 minutes before training to give the players GPS units, heart rate monitors, and then additionally, this, the, the Leela when we were using it for training. Um, and so it was great to see that the, the Leela calf sleeves and shorts, they take less than a minute to put on and apply to load, the load to. And it's something that the players can become autonomous with. So we can put them in the, in the locker room before training, 
and the players will take all of the stuff they need, uh, apply the load in the correct places after we've explained it to them. And it's really, really easy to use. And then in terms of the training itself, so we started um, off kind of really easy, building the load uh, and building the time that the players were exposed to Leela. So they started off uh, only wearing Leela for uh, warm-ups. And then over, it was around a four week period, we uh, had a steady overload of increasing the load itself from around 0.5% to 2% body mass. Then also increasing the time that the players wore this for so that they were able to withstand using Leela for full training sessions. And again, this slow but steady overload increased the buy-in from the players as well because they realized that it was not affecting uh, the technical aspects of their game. And also we had a lot of players say that after a while, they didn't even realize that they were wearing uh, the Lilo anymore because it felt to them like they were wearing normal football socks when they were wearing the car sleeves. So overall, we had a very positive first impression of Lila, uh, and this increased our interest in forming the studies um, that I'm going to outline to you today as well. Well, you know, it's something, it's something we heard that we hear that a lot. Everybody says, "Oh, I thought it was going to be hard," but like you know, Minnesota Vikings there in the NFL when they brought it in in last year, they implemented it through their full season. And he said, "My first thought is it looks great, but man, it's just going to be too hard to implement." And, and the head of performance there said, "Nothing could be further from the truth." But you're right. One of the reasons people people always ask me why it took so long to develop. We thought about that, and and because. Mm -hmm. Because we're sports science guys, I've been I've been in the in the trench with everything from the Olympics to the elite pros, and you, you don't have time, you know. So we 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 knew the process, we knew the things they would face, and and it's really good to hear that because I don't think there's a single coach or trainer listening right now who thinks they have more time, and I think that's one of the most important things is you don't add Lila training or X sorry not uh, Lila's our brand name just so everybody knows Exogen is the actual product. Um, but you don't take exogen and do more training with exogen. You just add exogen to what you're currently doing. So you don't have to now try and find more time to do this training. Not at all. It's if you've got 20 minutes in a warm up session, put the put the exogen on during the warm up. It takes a minute beforehand and let them warm up with it and have that specific load applied during your specific movements. Correct, Matt? This is this is a, mm -hmm. a lot around that logistic. Yeah, absolutely. So as I said, it's all about using exogen, but with normal football training. So it's, as, as we all know, um, time constraints within football training, especially within academies, are really, really strict. Mm. Um, you might have an hour and a half a day to train the players, and this has to include all of the technical, all of the technical, tactical, all of the physical work within that hour and a half. So if you can load these guys with the wearable resistance and carry on the training as normal, knowing that they're going to get on top of the tactical and technical work, the physical neuromuscular adaptations without necessarily having to do any more specialist work. Yeah. Instantly there, you're saving time. You're not even using the same amount of time. You're saving time because you, you can use it as almost an alternative to traditional on-field strength training. Right. Which, which you know, I mean, if you can replace a session or two in a week from the gym with Lee on field, everyone's going to be pretty happy about that. But just, um, I'll tell you what, let's jump into the meet. I'm going to close this window here and, and let you uh, run through your presentation and, and we'll listen in intently. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. So the first, uh, if you could just uh, put onto the next slide, please. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, one sec. Uh, let me find out why that's perfect. Thank you. So yeah, I'm just going to talk to you about one of the the studies that we've been doing here. Um, and it's entitled "Wearable Resistance During High Speed Running," and it's looking at the effect of the load and the load orientation. So where we place that load and what effects that orientation has. Um, so particularly in the last of decades the high intensity running and the sprint distances in football have increased massively so if you look at the overall running distance of a game 
they haven't really increased but if you look at the intensity of that running it's completely different from the kind of the early 2000s um, and so therefore the ability for footballers to perform repeated high speed runs is critical for their on-field success and then high speed running in the form of HIIT, so high intensity interval training, is a popular method to prepare footballers for, for this, these demands. So therefore, we wanted to carry out this study to see the effects of different wearable resistance loads and load orientation during this high speed running to have a look at the effects on strides, kinematics, so the data that you might get from an accelerometer, mm. and also mm. the muscle activation. Mm. And that's that's a question that's where everybody sort of starts if i add this load is it going to affect my mechanics is it going to per, you know what what is being affected because as you said we can put load on the body but now we can put it anywhere in a load at the knee and a load at the ankle even though it's the same weight as you've now seen it's a very different load absolutely yeah yeah and this is one of the things as well that we wanted to go to the players and to the staff here and say look we found this and this is answering their questions so they're more comfortable with using uh, this product in the training. Mm. So if you could just uh, go on to the, the next slide, please. And I think it might be, it might take two or three clicks because it's got a, a small effect in there. Yeah, maybe just one, one more. Um, for one more, please. Perfect, thank you. Okay. So yeah, for the, the work we do here at the club, um, we've taken particular interest in the calf sleeves. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for this. The first being the, the practicality aspect of the calf sleeves. Um, they're so, so quick and easy to give to the players quickly before training or even within a training session. And they're easy to take off quickly and they're really easy to um, fix whatever loads are required for that training session onto the calf sleeves. And then the other reason for using the calf sleeves uh, was because we wanted to target strength and power adaptations of the legs in particular. And in particular, the hamstrings and quadriceps. Um, and the reason that I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about later, but by loading the calf rather than the, the thighs, it increases that load that you're applying. So even if you have 1% of body mass on the thighs, and, uh, the load, and then have 1% body mass on the calf, the load is greater on the calf because it's further away from the point that, um, of rotation. So it's further away from the hip. Right. So that means that the, the body has to work hard to overcome these forces. And therefore you're getting a greater strength adaptation from, um, from the wearable resistance. And that's, that's lever systems 101. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's a bit of, bit of biomechanics. Hmm. So, so yeah, if you could just go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Give me a little play here, bear with me. Hold on. Oh, I think it might be saving the document right now. Oh. Just give it one sec. No problem. There we go. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, so just before I wanted, I wanted um, before I outline my study to you, I wanted to give you a little bit of an example of how exactly wearable resistance works in comparison to that traditional um, S and C, so traditional weightlifting. So if we look here, so we take the kinetic um, energy equation, so it's half the mass times the velocity squared. So if you look at this for a hundred kilo back squat. And if we're carrying this out at 0 0.58 meters a second, so that is an indication of roughly 70 to 80% of your one repetition max is carried out at this speed. And this gives a kinetic energy of 17.4 kilograms per meters per second. Now, if we look at the exoskeleton and using only one kilo of mass, but this is carried out at 6.1 meters a second, which is the equivalent of about 22 kilometers an hour. So what we'd class as a high speed running football. 
the organic it's natural a much more relevant speed as compared to a pretty non-relevant speed. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's carried out at competition velocity, as, as was mentioned before. You're getting an increase on that kinetic energy compared to the back spot of 18.6 kilograms per meters per second. So while it looks like a really small load, because mm. of the velocities that you're carrying out, carrying that out at, you're at, you're increasing the workload of that training session than if you were to do that instead. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember this slide. This is huge. Yeah, really, really interesting. It came from this came directly from John at AUT. So yeah, I always use this whenever I'm presenting about Leela. It's well, it's, it's the one thing that kind of really, really buys someone into the how how Leela works. And then imagine wearing that one key because that squat you do for one set of 10. That Leela, that one kilogram of exogen is on there for 20 minutes. Exactly, exactly. So you're getting that output for a full training session rather than three sets of 10, for example. So yeah, to go into the study itself, um, so we carried out a study where we used 10 well-trained participants. So it's basically all the performance staff here. And this study was designed to provide all the information we could to the staff and the players so that we could go confidently onto the field and use wearable resistance. So we all carried out 10 sets of three 10 second runs at 18 kilometers an hour. Uh, and we, as I said before, we measured the muscle activity of the hamstring and quadricep muscles. And as well, we measured the floor contact time, the peak force of the, the foot, the, uh, the strides, the step frequency and the vertical stiffness, uh, all using accelerometers. So you just go to the, the next slide, please. Yeah, so this is just kind of a little example of how we loaded um, the, the participants in the study. So we used five different loads. So the first was a control that we could compare all the loads to. So we, we all ran three repetitions without any load. And then after we here. Yeah. 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 And then we did 0.75% um, body mass compared to 1.5% body mass. Um, so your 0.75 is A and uh, B is 1.5%. Right. And this is loaded at the back of the cab. So for those listening, just remember, you can put that load anywhere. And also loading on the posterior of the leg or the anterior of the leg changes the muscle and the muscle action a lot. And, and players and, and coaches figure that out very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's why we also looked at comparing proximal and distal loading. So proximal was kind of where you see the loads quite high um, right here. below the knee. Yeah. Near and then, close to the knee. Yeah. And then distal loading is right down near the ankle. Yeah. Here, here. Yeah. And just yeah. so people are aware, taking that load, you see the back of the leg, you've got all this weight up high right near the knee and just shifting it down, changing the orientation and putting the same amount of load, but now down at the lower end of the leg has a massive change in the output of the athlete and the experience. And that's, yeah, absolutely. that's essentially what the whole study was trying to do. And the very first study worldwide to quantify this with EMG. And then the, yeah, as you said before, the, the final condition was looking at, um, anterior versus posterior loading. So front versus back yeah. loading. Let's do this one and this one here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Should I jump? Then, oh. Yeah, if you could just go to the next slide, that'd be, that'd be great. So yeah, the main findings of the study. Um, so first of all, the effect of 1.5% body mass, that was the heavier of the loads we used. Uh, was uh, slightly higher than the effect of 0.75% body mass on stride frequency. So effectively, the, the greater the load, the more steps. And that is suggesting that, in fact, the, it's causing the steps to be slightly shorter than without load or with a lighter load. Mm. Um, stride frequency also showed small to moderate increases for all of the loading placements compared with control. 
And then looking more specifically at distal loading, we found that there was an increase in the quadricep muscle activity compared with proximal loading. Uh, and it, this did not affect stride frequency. And then finally, unilateral loading, so only loading one leg, showed a decrease in muscle activity in the quadriceps compared to the unloaded leg. So if you could just go to the next slide, please. So in conclusion, the main findings for this were that by increasing wearable resistance load, it is possible to modify running mechanics and reduce neuromuscular activity during high-speed running. So this is the difference between 1.5% and 0.75% body mass. And the second main finding was that distal loading placement can increase neuromuscular load without causing differences in running mechanics in comparison to proximal load placement. So if we're going to look at that from a practical standpoint, so something that can translate to kind of on real on-field practical uh, views, um, the important thing of this is that um, by increasing the load, it's possible to increase stride frequency by reducing your muscular activity. So this could be a really good tool for that late stage return to play training where you can increase the locomotor aspect of the training. And this can be increased um, above and beyond normal training. So to overload this, but without increasing the risk of injury occurrence, because you're not having, a, uh, you're not increasing neuromuscular activity. And then on the other hand, um, by moving the load more distally, so further towards the ankle from the knee, uh, this can increase the neuromuscular load, but it does not affect the running technique. So this could be a really useful way to increase the intensity of a training session without being a detriment to running technique or um, football technique as well. What would be really interesting for me as well is we weren't able to quantify the metabolic load from this study. So the effect on um, aerobic or anaerobic fitness. And so it'd be really cool to do another study to have a look at this because I know from personal experience and talking with the players that as well as that neuromuscular effect, um, wearing Leela increases heart rate, it increases um, the, the kind of the, the rating of difficulty that we take from the players at the end of training, um, and it increases re uh, breathing rate. So these are all indications that in fact Leela can be used to increase fitness as well as strength. Yeah, and, and interestingly, you were... Um you know, talking about those areas that we're going into. I just want the, you, the, the listeners to know, so our team at uh, AUT Sprint with Jock, John Cohn in New Zealand, they've already published over 30 published papers on exogen. And so, but this is the first time we've been dive, we've, well, the first time in one of the very first very high level areas that we're looking at it in football. We've done a lot of stuff in speed mechanic. We've seen a lot of interesting things. But the two things that were really unique for us as a company was this was the first study to actually get the EMG activity, which is massive because we've always been wondering what is happening in those areas. And the second one to be talking about changes in technique and high speed running and not seeing those changes because, as you know, and, and every one of these coaches, trainers know, if you introduce new tech, nobody wants anything that screws up their game and, and, they, and they, they get it right. Like they're, they're not looking to change themselves mechanically. They're looking to improve. And maybe you can just comment on, it lends us into the place. And we're doing this right now. I mean, Justin Gatlin, Shaq Perry Richardson, you know, Bednarik, uh, Blake. These are four of the six, 10, 12 fastest sprinters in the world training with this for Tokyo right now. But, but talking about how important it is with, with high level footballers not to be affecting mechanics, and why that's important for coaches and physios. Yeah, absolutely. So um, for a footballer, their, their technique and having that technique really primed is what makes a difference between them being a great footballer and a good footballer. So it can be your technique can give you that split second advantage over somebody else to get the ball away from them to move past them. And so for a footballer, they want to have that confidence in a technology or in a training technique that is not going to come at a detriment to their, their football technique. 
because if it does, they will have no interest in using it. So it was really yeah. important for us to find, to conduct these studies, to give the players the confidence um, to use this product without it being a detriment to their technique. And what we've shown here is that it, it can be used in that way. And there's no player I know that would prefer being in the gym other than the field. Yeah, absolutely. So if they can integrate the neuromuscular training, the strength training, as well as that on-field training, then it's it's uh, it's perfect for them. Oh, sorry, I just clicked. Is that was this the the, the last one? The end. So now, Matt. Uh, I mean, this is an exciting study, but there are really exciting areas that PSG is also looking at. And there's two things I wanted you to compliment, uh, just to, to maybe. Uh, uh, comment on that we were talking about with John that I think will resonate with coaches here. One is talking about the, like you said, Leela doesn't just improve speed and power and give the ability to target individually specific mechanical issues on field. But you talked about, uh, you know, sort of that strength maintenance and that enduring component and trying to keep those fit in what's called a congested schedule. Football is getting more, not less not just in terms of the volume, but also the number of games these guys are exposed to. And, and, and with looking at solutions that allow us to develop and build and maintain strength and, and get effective on-field strategies in a time poor or congested schedule is one of the areas I know that you're looking at and maybe, like I said, get some comment on that. And the other one is this very interesting area of substitution and load compensation when you have players that aren't uh, exposed to the same amount of play in game time. So load compensation for substitute players and how important that is to be managed by the SNC and the sports science team, especially in a pro level program. Just to just touch base on some of your thinking in those areas. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, these are two areas that we're kind of really interested in doing some studies on um, once we've kind of got the the ones we're doing now published and, and completed. Um, I really feel that with, with wearable resistance on specifically with exogen, we're really only scratching the surface of what is what we're capable of doing with this, uh, not only in football, but in, in team sports, in any sport. Um, and yeah, the, the first kind of big area of interest for us is how Leela can be beneficial in um, kind of in seasons where it's really congested. So the training and game schedule, as you say, is getting busier and busier for teams and the seasons kind of seem to mold into one, one another with increasing pre-season demands. You know, players are expected now to play pre-season tournaments um, basically straight off the back of finishing the last season and then to counter in things like international tournaments as well, which is quite fitting now. You know, we've only finished a season a couple of weeks ago and now we're in the Euros. And then once the Euros are finished, there'll be maybe a week or two off and then we're straight into pre-season and then straight into season again. And these, these top, top players, they can be playing two or even three games a week if they're involved in lots of different competitions. Um, and so one of the ways that we thought that we could use Leela is to ensure that the training sessions between these games have the, the kind of correct level of intensity um, and are maintaining the player's fitness, but without being too long, that they're going to result in a cumulative fatigue. Right. So that you find that players are really dropping off the pace in the second half of the season. And so, so what we want to do is we want to have a look if it's possible um, to kind of hit that sweet spot of um, using Lila in a way that is, yeah, is going to have... Um, keep the training at really high intensity, but maybe it's possible to reduce the length of that training. And then you've got players that are fresher, have less fatigue and are uh, more ready, if you like, to play two or three games a week. Well, like I remember Martin saying to me, the three games a week, what 186 games in a year for some of these guys. He said, you know, on a Sunday, we get one day to go in the gym. And we do even a little bit of leg work and Monday, Tuesday, they're sore. I pay for that. You know, it's my fault. And there's a bad performance. And, and, and as you said, to explain it, if we can build in solutions that add resistance into their on-field play that's already existing and doesn't create that cumulative fatigue that we know 
a lot of traditional strength training does because of the focus it has, then, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a win-win. And, and, um, and players are smart. Like they know what will benefit them and where. And, and I think that's going to be a really exciting area. We're seeing that in the NFL. We're seeing that with other pro teams. Like uh, one of our, our good partners now is Golden State Warriors with uh, Steph Curry. And a lot of them are doing exactly that on core training to really boost well, not only individual weaknesses, you, but in, in, in lieu of or as replacement of some of the S&C stuff that would be more, more, more traditional based, right? And some of those, especially those advanced players, they need less and less of that, you know? And instead of struggling to find time for it, maybe it's time we found different solutions for it, different periodization models in season. Exactly, and that, that ties in a little bit with the, the second point that you talked about, about the using Leela for compensatory and supplementary training as well. Because in these really congested seasons, you, you need to use your entire football squad. You know, it's not just about the 11 players, it's about that 22 to 25 players that you've got in the squad. And for those guys, they may, they may miss two games and then play the next game, miss two games again, play the next game. But if they're a substitute for those games, practitioners, sports science, strength and conditioning practitioners need to ensure that these players, that the players' fitness is maintained and their readiness to, to play games is maintained. And one way we do this is to have uh, compensation training either directly after the games or in training uh, the, the next day. But again, the problem with that is the time constraints. If, if you have a player who needs to do additional uh, high-speed running distance and sprint distance following a game, you may have a window of 15 to 20 minutes after a game before the player has to quickly go in, get ready and get the team bus home. Or additionally, the next day, if they're doing it, they might be required to train with the team. So you maybe, again, have 15 to 20 minutes to quickly do this compensation training to, make, to maintain their fitness. And so it is possible that we can use exogen um, to increase the intensity of these very short training sessions to ensure that the player is getting that training load without it being a detriment to the rest of the team's training or um, without the, the time constraints getting in the way. So again, we want to do a study to look at um, how we can use Leela and the best way to use Leela to for, for compensation training to make sure that player is ready at all times throughout the season for for games. Yeah, I mean, it's a, like you said, it, what, that's why we started with that slide with the force velocity curve, right? It's knowing your tools in your toolbox and it's not, you don't need this tool anymore, but it, but you have, you have to be so efficient. And Exogen for me has always, I didn't really know what Exogen was gonna become when I was creating it. I was on a track training an Olympic sprinter, running sprints with a sled. And the coach and I were just frustrated with the mechanical change that was going on because of the dynamic of the sled. And everybody knows that story. And I was just trying to think, how can we get weight on the body so we can train sprinting without all that mechanical change? But as this has grown and grown and grown and seeing these, you know, it's become, it, like I said, it's become the tool at that high velocity, specific on field, that level of stimulus and load that we're, we've been trying to take the traditional, the heavy resistance and force it into that category, but it doesn't go. You know, as, as somebody he said to me from Team Exos, you know, Exos out of the USA, quite a well-known organization. He was the, the head of education there, Nick Winkleman. And he said, you know, Joe, every coach has been trying to figure out how to glue weight to the body. You guys have done it. Now we just have to figure out how to use it. Mm. And, and so, so, like I said, it's getting kind of creative in that area, right? Absolutely. For me, the, the possibilities are, are kind of endless, even if you look at swapping the, moving the load kind of, what, 30 centimeters down the leg, and you've already got a different neuromuscular output yeah. from only doing that. And now to take into account that you can move the load onto the sides, you can have it medially, laterally, you can have it uh, on the thighs and on the calves, you know, you can have it anywhere you want. So if we can find a way to quantify all these differences and know exactly what muscles are activated, how this um, 
how these different orientations and different loads can be used, then there's no reason why Leela can't be a product that is used every day in, in foot, not only football training, but in any, any sport training to kind of get athletes to the next level. Well, and, and I think it's important people know, although this is, we're, this is kind of exploratory stuff there with PSG, but I mean, we were working with the All Blacks at the World Cup in 2018, Golden State and the, and the NBA has been into the product for the last three, four years on court, the NFL, the NHL. So there's a lot of programs that are building it in and using it. And I think what's exciting now is we're just, we're, we're targeting football, we're looking at it, but it's already a solution tool for many of the best programs in the world. And it, I can tell you, because I work with these guys every day, these are exactly the same conversations we're having. But it really is with those organizations who are absolutely looking to improve that whole athlete experience in their club. You know, the people that are just looking for traditional, you know, another way to do a bar, they're not looking for this. They're not trying to advance the game, but it's, it's just a fantastic conversation. And like you said, the possibilities are endless. But what I want to do now, we've got about 15 minutes left, and I'd like to kind of wrap this last section for five minutes and jump into some Q&A. Um, is just give a little overview of these protocols because I'm sure people are wondering, okay, well, where would I start? We've talked about so many possibilities. How do you get it in? I've got a little bit of these slides I showed you before on the protocol where I'm currently guiding and working with programs to put exogen into their current training. Sound good? And, and Matt, you can um, jump in as you, as you like, as you see. Okay, sounds good. Uh, let me just, and then we'll wrap up with uh, into questions. This is just one slide also from JC talking about rotational workload. So this is the one position. So you have a 200 gram to up to a thousand grams loaded at your hip, loaded mid thigh or loaded at the knee. Take a look at the, and this is looking at rotational workload change. So at the hip, of course, is zero. When you move that 200 grams, you're doing a six to 7% increase in rotational workload not by changing the weight, but by changing the position of the weight. And this is exactly what Matt and the team at PSG are quantifying right now in uh, via EMG. But look at as you start to get to, you know, maybe 1% of body weight, you're talking about a 25% increase in rotational workload at high speed, just moving the weight up and down the leg. And that's, that's just a fantastic thing. We've never had a tool that gave us this kind of versatility before. And the athletes do that themselves. I mean, you see it, Matt, right? They come in, they start their warm up, they put it at their hip. Then once they get moving, they just move it down. It gets a little harder. And it's as simple as. Yeah, exactly. Um, we, we have yeah, examples here of exactly that. We'll, we'll start off kind of quite high either on the, on the thighs or on the, on the calf. Yep. And then we'll tell the players to move it down slowly. And also we do that over a more kind of um, kind of chronic basis. So for uh, return to play, for example, we use it quite a lot in that where say if a player has had quite a significant injury and we know they're going to have four weeks before they go back to team training, we might start off with 0.5% body mass loaded uh, approximately, so just behind the knee. Mm. And then within that four weeks, we'll provide a steady overload where we'll go approximately medially distally, but we'll also increase the load from 0.5 to 1% to 2% body mass. Right. And what you're effectively doing is your overload in the last week before they go back to training, you're overloading their training to a higher level that they'll have to perform at when they return to the team. So it gives the player the confidence that they're not going to have injury occurrence. Right they can cope with the physical demands of that training, but also they, they go back into the training and realize they are back at that level. You know, it's not a case of having to try to get them to train a little bit again. They're already back at the level to be able to train with the team. And that's fantastic. And the other thing that does, like you said, especially at this pro or at the high level club level, that plays with the player's mind in a positive way. They know this is working. They understand it and they feel it. And they know, okay, these next couple of weeks are going to be uploading, but in my football movement, we're not talking about gym movement. We're talking about what they're feeling with the ball at their feet. Mm -hmm. And when that weight comes off, you know what happens then. You know, it's just, it's game on. 
exactly yeah yeah and it's uh, yeah it's it, like i said it's specific well, let me just uh so one of the other studies uh, as you know this is the one from the argentina study this is of course dr john cronin who's certainly one of the if not the guru in strength speed and power and, and certainly the world leader in, in wearable resistance and this was just interesting one little study that we did it, with one of the speed research studies and right now like i said we've got a whole bevy of the world's best preparing for tokyo there's going to be some gold tinting on Lila come Tokyo, I can tell you that. But he was saying in just 60, even with the football warm up protocol that was came out of Argentina, they did a little more deep analysis based on some of the work that they did out of Japan. And they were talking about that an athlete could effectively improve a 40 meter, 40 yard dash time from 4.5 seconds to a 439 in just five weeks. Now, if you know, anything about the NFL, that 40 yard time is what they, all the, all the speed athletes in the NFL measure. And if you're a four or five sprinter over 40 yards, you're pretty good. If you hit a four, three, nine, you just add three zeros to your contract, you know, and that's the person who's half a meter every step ahead. Now, this is just a quick outline on the, the warm up study. So, for those listening, this is uh, Club Atletico Belgrano, who are the under 17 national champions in Argentina. So again, all these guys are contracted out to big clubs somewhere, very high level. This was an in-season study. Now, if you're a club level coach, you don't let people play with your in-season unless it's gonna give you some benefit without disturbing mechanics. Eight weeks of putting exogen just into the warm-up three times a week. So 20 to 25 minutes of their normal football warmup had a significant boost on speed, acceleration, lower body strength power, and improved repeated sprint ability and high level sprint running as described by GPS. <clears throat> and this was exactly what you were talking about, uh, Matt. They didn't do anything different. They just put on their calf sleeves, loaded up, and half the players wore exogen for the warm-up, half of them didn't. And, and it was, and, and this is this is published. This is a published high performance research journal. And these are just a couple of little clips for you just to see these guys moving with exogen. Half of them have the calf sleeves on, half of them don't. But there is no restriction. <coughs> that guy's wearing exogen right there. <coughs> Normal warm up, just with just with load. And and this is football specific running. Yeah, this isn't sprinting. a couple little clips to give you an idea what that looks like. Now, you know, under 17 players in Argentina are pretty high level. Uh, and I think that's kind of it. So I'm going to just whip through this last little slide. It just gives coaches a little idea where they would put exogen in. Okay. And we'll just move through quick. And then I think we'll have those uh, like a uh, uh, question and answer. We're, like I said, we started 15 minutes or uh, we're, um, late, but we're going to finish up here in the next five, 10 minutes. So again, for anybody who's training out there, you have three levels of four levels of things you're working on. You're either in training, you're in practice, you're in competition, or you're in recovery. Training, of course, is your gym work, your speed work, your change of direction, your ancillary, ancillary work, core work, whatever it might be. Practice, of course, is your direct playing time with your technical, tactical skills uh, on display. Competition is competition, and recovery is recovery. Exogen has sort of seven protocols. Warm-up protocol, where you build it into your warm-ups that already exist for four to six, eight weeks and you see a significant change in on-field performance 
without changing anything in your specific time schedule. The next one we call is our technique protocol. And that'll be in your practice session as well, but you're working on very football specific activities. It could be restarts, it could be fast breaks, specific moves, keeper specific skills, penalty shots, corner kicks, whatever it is. But building exogen in for specific movements, not just the general condition. Gameplay. And this is really the short sided game stuff. And it relates a lot to number three, what you were talking about, Matthew, that endurance component. Put that yeah. exogen on when they're doing their 5v5s, 3v3s, that team play, you know, A squad versus B squad at the end of running, and let them run with that higher intensity to boost gameplay, whether they are they're in need of extra stimulus because they're a substitute or it's just something they need at that time of the year. And then the other one, the big area is return to play. Return to play is basically rehab protocol. Once the injury is healed, getting exogen to that return to play phase to really isolate that, usually the single side, you know, the lower leg, the knee, the thigh, the calf, the glutes, the arm, the lower back on a unilateral level so that they can rebalance and reposition uh, the body to get them back to high level play. It's critical. And I can tell you right now, not only is Steph Curry, one of the guys who did his return to play with exercise, but some of the very best athletes in the world have gone through return to play protocol with exogen and gone on to win world championships, Olympic or set world records. It's an area we're absolutely getting a lot of attention on. And just because it's so individual and so specific, right, Matt? You were- Yeah, I think, um, as you say, the fact that you can literally load anywhere means that it can be a completely individual process to ensure that, that that player is going to return from that injury so yeah. as you say if you've got a kind of a lower limb injury just by loading one of the calves unilaterally you can you can re readdress the the um the loss of balance between the, the two sides and very and quickly then, too it happens very quickly yeah exactly and then you can then once they kind of get back to like a, a level of equality, you can then load both sides again and get them back to above the baseline level before the injury occurrence. Because by doing that, again, you're minimizing uh, any risk of the injury occurrence. Well, the other area we had looking at uh, like the All Blacks before the Olympics when they won the silver medal and their captain, we did their whole rehab before their qualification. And the, the thing was, she was injured with a bad lower leg injury. She went back to the field. The coach and everybody said, you're not ready to be back here, but the physios had already signed her off. The injuries healed, but the body wasn't. So mm -hmm. they called me up and I put together a six week program with her. It's been written up in the New Zealand Sports Physiotherapy Journal. And all we did was that. We rebalanced the weight back to that leg. Once the weight shifted and she started that, everything started working into play. Then we started working on the individual muscles but what it did for her was the confidence. When she went to the field and was sent back, she was destroyed. And, but rebuilding it, that confidence gave her the confidence. And in a contact game like rugby, you know, I mean, confidence is everything. Like football, if you don't get that confidence back, you don't play the same. And football, it's a contact sport, let's be honest. Yeah, well, likewise with that, we've had players where you can do... Um, Kind of medical tests you can do um a dynamometer test you know to look at the the raw strength of the injured compared to the non-injured muscles and they might have been signed off by a physio or doctor because it's showing that they can produce the same amount of force of those muscles but then you put them on the field and suddenly you get that psychological aspect if you even if you look at things like um jump tests you might instantly see there is a 15 to 30 percent difference in force between the the leg that was injured and the leg that wasn't because they are not confident in using it in a practical environment and i think um just by having that load stimulus and building that up slowly it's a psychological thing as well because they're getting the confidence back to run and play how they did pre-injury and, and the confidence and the RTP stage is marred by lack of confidence. That's the thing they're worried about because the injury is healed. 
the physio is signing off saying that ACL is done. It's as strong as it's ever going to be. That leg isn't, but that ACL is. And, and you mentioned you mentioned 30%. In the case with the All Blacks returning and winning the silver medal at the Olympics, she had a 30% discrepancy in ground reaction forces when we measured her at high speed running left to right on the bilateral treadmill. And in five, six weeks, we changed that from 30% to one to 2%, which basically means non-existent. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it was fantastic. So coaches, if you are looking at stuff in that rehab area, it really is a pretty magic tool because of that specificity. And the other areas here, your SNC protocol, basically that's taking exogen and saying, it's a really cool weighted vest or weighted shorts or ankle weight. You can put it into your, you know, your non-specific or your specific speed, your agility, your body weight, your core, your body weight circuit, travel kit on the road to keep base strength, everything from push-ups to sit-ups, you name it. With the extra load, it's a lot of fun, it's easy, but that's when you just treat it like a traditional resistance tool. And then the last thing we call is the recovery protocol, as you might've seen that the calf sleeves are comfortable, they actually offer you compression benefits. So wearing it after training is certainly something that we can, that people can do. Now, um, and, and just where people ask is, I'll just let you know a little bit about Exogen for football. So these are the products that were talked about today. For every sport, we have a start kit, core kit, an elite kit, and what we call our keepers are a specialty kit. For football, the real pieces, and you, you don't need a full suit, you definitely need to get those legs moving. And as you said, Matt, those calf sleeves are so logistically easy to implement. Once you get into more off season work and higher speed stuff and very individual differences, the core, the shorts, of course, are where the prime movers are. But any comment just on that on the legs and the lower body? Uh, yeah, I think, as you say, if you're dealing with kind of 20 to 30 athletes, the calf sleeves are brilliant because they're so quick to put on, they're so quick to take off, it's so easy to see at a glance that the player has the load, the correct load in the correct place that you ask them to put it. Um, they, they are comfortable, you know, they're, they're basically football socks, they're, yeah. they're going to have the same tightness as football socks, so the players don't mind wearing them. And then again, the shorts, they're so easy to put on under normal football shorts. You know, they don't, they don't have to replace normal shorts. They, because they're compression garments, they can be worn underneath. Like tight. And again, it, yeah, exactly. And it's, it's very easy to see where the load is. Um, and with the shorts as well, you can actually increase that load a little bit more because there's, there's more room effectively to put the, the load. Right. And, and then what we call the elite kit. So the top in football, obviously, the, the top has use for certain players if certain mechanics are needed to work. Rotation issues, low back issue, posture issues when they get tired. And again, it's not the absolute critical piece because football is a game of legs. And then, but that last piece of the arm sleeve, that really is the keeper kit. You know, keepers do a lot of specialized work. And that upper body kit for some of the keepers is even more important than the lower body kit. This is just a short, uh, I've got a really short click, just from one of the national squads here. This is the national keeper of Malaysia. Um, of course, they're, you know, they're a good level, and, but they're training going through specific drills with the top and shorts on under their kit. Sorry, the shorts. All right, hold on. Let me uh, just find my cursor here. So they're just getting, he's wearing the full arm sleeves. And just to work on turning on those arms. He's got about one and a half percent of body weight per sleeve. Sorry, a total. How does that feel? Can feel? Okay. Comfortable? Yeah, not, not moving. Though. And again, he's not in the gym, right? Like that guy's diving with his shorts and arm sleeves on. You, you can do full movements here. And so the players quickly get full confidence. And as you talked about, Matt, they don't notice it's there. They're able to do their movements, but they're loaded, right? Yeah, as you can see, there's no kind of detriment to their, 
the technique there. They're, they're carrying on as normal. And to be honest, at this point, they probably don't even realize they're loaded anymore because they're so kind of focused on the training that they're, they're just carrying out as normal. So they're getting that extra load, which is obviously really nice. And now he's unloaded and you see just really nice, quick movement. So he's really light here. And again, you know, his body just feels light. He feels quick. He feels good. And everybody likes that. Improved. And that was a little bit of Malay for you. He said it's awesome. <laughs> um, so that kind of wraps it now. Let's, uh, let's just see on the chat. Did any questions pop up, Eugene? No, not yet. We've got, like I said, we wanted to keep this to about 75 minutes. We've gone over by about three or four by, um, with, the, with the delay. But if there's anybody who has a question, you've got Matt here. Uh, and, you know, whatever you, you want to you ask uh, related to the topic, related to the tech, what they're looking at over there, please feel free to uh, take a moment to ask and, um, and we'll be happy to answer. And thank you, best, most important, Thank you for sitting by and listening for those of you here on a Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, or Sunday midnight, Eugene. <laughs> it's now uh, 1.30 in the morning here. But Asians are used to late night because we all watch EPL at three o'clock in the morning. So this is normal <laughs> to have a football talk at this hour. Yeah, so I mean, like I, uh, I don't see any questions coming in. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, that's, a, that's because we answered them all. But um, I'll tell you what we'll do if there's nothing to be asked right now, or if you want to turn off your, your mute and, and just ask a question, that's fine. Um, Matt, Adam is not here, so I'm going to close us out. Um, and all the information that you've, you've seen presented here, I'll make sure Adam is given a copy of those slides. Uh, is it okay if I share your slides with them if they if they want to have a look, Matt? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, just don't share them publicly everywhere because that research does want to get published. But yeah. uh, we'll, I will share this presentation with Adam. So coaches, he's more than happy to get that to you. Uh, there's a recording of this that Adam will have as well. And he could share it for if you want some of this information down the road. And we'd be happy to uh, answer questions on email or whatnot individually as we go. But uh, I just want to take a moment first, uh, Matt, just thank you for taking the time. Uh, thank you for your interest in the product. You know, as, as the CEO, it's, it's always wonderful to meet people that are as passionate about it as you. And, um, and it's, to be honest, I'm kind of inspired. I didn't even know some of the stuff we talked about today. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what comes out of this continued relationship with TST. Yeah, thank you, too. It'd be, it'd be interesting to see where, where we can go and the other, the, the other studies we can do and you know what, how we can use it further in football. Sounds good. Well, again, Eugene, thanks for setting things up. And for all you coaches, Rafael, Dominic, Pietro, and Bartos, uh, I look forward to having a glass of vodka with you there in Poland sometime <laughs> soon. But um, stay healthy and stay safe, and we'll uh, sign off on that. Cheers, Matt. Thanks again, Jack. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks, man. Ciao. Okay, everybody, Bye. take care. Thanks, Gene. Peace.